that to be said, I do all of this just to help people get discovered. <laughs> you don't need a ton of visibility to get discovered. You just need better actionable shares. You need once once someone sees you, once you're visible, once you've been exposed, right? What we do next matters. And, and those are that's what I get excited about. And just for those who are listening, this is Vinny. He's an Emmy Award winning media advisor and a creator economist. And we're going to talk about what that means and then just some of some advice he gives to help you become more discoverable. Yeah, right. And this like annoying LinkedIn uh, job title, buzzy, annoying world of, of titles. How did I land on creator economist? By the way, I was at MTV in the late 90s. I, I feel like I worked with modern storytellers, Ashton Kutcher. Jessica Simpson, uh, Sharon Osbourne. I worked with modern storytellers who came through TV because we had access to, you know, an audience and and live. We had the ability to go live. So I also know what it's like to work on, you know, on on that, on that news segment. So, look, looking now at the power of of storytelling, not to say that uh, MTV created the genre, but certainly put a spotlight on it. Uh, certainly created music video format and. The first VJ at MTV, Adam, is sort of credited with creating the first podcast at, at iPodder. Really? So, yeah, yeah. This idea of of a platform that that has uh, leaned into an audience that requires a certain type of of story told in, in a new way um, has been something that I was like fascinated with. At MTV in the early '80s, it was music videos, right? So they come out with music videos. And it's funny because if you look at it, if you look at like the client, the climate of media, then all the networks, well, MTV's got music videos. Like we can't have music videos. MTV has music videos. Imagine if that, if, if, if what happened then happened now, a day later, there'd been 50 different networks being like, we do music videos also. But what MTV, <laughs> what MTV did was create a, a platform, create a type of programming music videos, and then funded it. So it wasn't like they just asked all the artists to put music videos into their marketing budgets and production budgets. There was deals with MTV and the top labels that were financial. And at that point in the 80s, the deals were a little lax because there weren't so many other places where music videos could go. And if a music video went anywhere, most likely like a nightclub, a disco, you know, like thinking of the places where we saw music videos in the 80s or 90s. MTV kind of got credit. There was like this halo effect. Oh, I saw that video on MTV as I'm in my favorite bar. You know, oh, I, I saw that video. I remember in 1991 where I was. It's the, the power of, of, of exclusivity in that format. Uh, and then Adam, the uh, Alan, I'm sorry, the one of the first VJs uh, created iPodder and this idea of uh, a really simple syndication, an audio file downloaded in. And so on and so forth, but 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 creating innovating innovating media property media types that's cool. I got I to MTV. They also innovated the uh, MTV Cribs. I love cribs. that. And then now now you still see that today. People doing that on TikTok, and you still see even like some of the million dollar lister, listings are selling Sunset. Some of those are similar concepts. Yeah, it's like. it's it, it um it's hard not to say how much was inspired from MTV because it was first. Um, so what that does is in television, if there was a special that we, we had the show um, called Becoming, where it was literally about like uh, people wanting to be an artist. So, so that turning into like American Idol or, or com a talent competition show, there's been there's a lot sort of stems from from what happened at MTV. But, but I got to be honest, the power of people, man, like well, what we did with the narrative, we saw the value in story. We saw that it was cheaper. We now understood that our stories were cheaper to buy if we use them in real people than if I tried to get like uh, scripted rights and the ma the manufactured part of of a reality that is untrue. That's all comes at an expense, and that it's actually cheaper as we learn from cable television to work on our own stories. And then with the advent of social media, we leaned in deeply into owning our own stories. Like I was at MTV at a point where you were, by the way, you brought up Cribs. Sharon wanted to do a reality version, something with the Osbournes, had no clue what it was. And ultimately we came up with the idea of booking Kelly and Jack on Cribs because we thought, well, well, what would be neat to see the house? And we knew what the house looked like. And, and it was that video 
from that episode of Crips that we used internally to green light what we described as uh, Osborne's meets the real world, yes. I think is like what the official uh, pilot tagline was. And then the rest of it, and again, the power of people. When you give us, the, you know, well, what MTV did in the early 80s was record uh, celebrities. What, what we did in the late 90s was just give them the camera. Here, mm -hmm. Jessica Simpson, people don't understand you. Tell us your story. Here, Ashton Kutcher, modern modern media mogul. People don't understand the value that you bring to this media world and that you have your thumb your pul the, on the pulse of, like, pop culture. Here's a camera. Go create. You know, here, Osborne's. And, and that was a, a huge explosion of, of successful programming that impacted TV. In 07, when I left, YouTube was coming out. YouTube was now playing music videos. So I was like, you know, uh, other networks were starting to air reality shows that I was, you know, I wanted Simple Life. That didn't end up on MTV. Uh, there was a show called Project Runway. I thought that would have been a really cool show uh, to, to complement uh, House of Style, which was our fashion show on MTV. And I realized that it wasn't that MTV was losing its audience, but that the media market had just like exponentially grown. And that's where, that's where I had to take the leap. It was like, I can't, and I didn't stay in television in 07. I, the first thing I did was help YouTube do like a live splash page takeover where we gave away a private island in partnership with Samsung. And I would do these big Macy's million dollar makeover where, where we're literally searching the world and giving away a million dollars a year for, for five or six years. That actually became a TV show. So I quickly became fat, infatuated, to be really honest, with the digital world because of ownership, the IP. It was cool to be working with with creators who own their content as and that was the big shift is the creators wanted to start owning all their yeah you saw first with red bull remember when people were like yo red bull doesn't partner with anyone they just only produce their own stuff and they're spending hundreds of thousand of dollars out of the gate only owning it and people and i remember people thinking, what's what's the plays or are they building a catalog are they going to try to sell it to some network and here they were like no we're going to be the network <laughs> None, yeah. none, none of that, none of that partnership stuff to, to cut the costs. We're going to absorb the cost. And, you know, it's actually, if you look at uh, um, uh, Game of Thrones and like Lord of the Rings prequel that's happening on Amazon and on the HBO right now, you're right. House of Dragon. I think that's like uh, the amount of money that they had to spend on that up front because they already had some of those pieces wasn't as much as they had to spend on uh, on on Lord of the Rings. That that what's that? What's that one called? Oh, that's what you're talking about. With, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I forget the name of that house. No, no, no. It's all no. it's all dragons and fanfare. And I know. I was way off. That was. But the, but the, no no no. But you're, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same night of programming for me. By the way. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, but they they had to spend a lot more money to invest in the beginning part of that world. Uh, over five seasons that will have been absorbed and per episode it will be you know it'll have much more different it'll have a much different impact yeah that to be said i do all of this just to help people get discovered <laughs> you don't need a ton of visibility to get discovered you just need better actionable shares you need once once someone sees you once you're visible once you've been exposed right what we do next matters and, and those are that's what i get excited about now um with podcasting uh, uh, as a talent brand or as a, an individual who owns a brand, a brand owner, whether you are identify as an SMB owner, an entrepreneur, a founder led business owner, the, the, the power of our stories that we can own them is gigantic. And what we can do in between it, like I'm not looking for advertisers on my podcast. I'm probably never going to have advertisers on my podcast outside of my friends whose podcasts I'm supporting. I have advertisement I get advertisement dollars from repurp from prepurposing my video content on television. But what I don't try to do is bring that ad world from television into my podcast only right. because I, I've already done that <laughs> in TV. And I, I just wanted a really different experience. And so if someone's just launched a new brand or new business, new idea, whatever it is, where, what would be the first step that you would recommend for them? Uh, in terms of visibility? Yeah, and just getting out there in the world and becoming more discoverable. Just, I think, know, know what some of your options are. So out of the gate, I have to let you know that uh, awards, you know, uh, awards that that are free to apply to and awards that you do, do require a fee. Most awards require a fee 
to be considered. Like I have to pay a fee when I'm up for a nomination or for an Emmy and Beyonce has to pay for her Grammy nomination. So there, it's, it's normal to pay for awards, but there are lots of award opportunities that most podcasters aren't aware of. And, and those are the ones that I get passionate about people knowing about. Uh, out of the gate, how to get paid. You know, what, what, what platforms are actually paying podcasters, identify podcasters as a creator type when they talk about the creator economy. Um, I have a list of over 100 awards worthy of winning, uh, over 60 platforms that pay. Uh, credits, the importance of credits. You know, uh, we'll, we'll create something and we think for some reason maybe we get credit a year later or when, when our time is due. Maybe that I hate that. You know, time is due now. <laughs> well, I'm I'm my own late library card. Like the time is due now. On IMDb, the Internet Movie Database, the the catalog of IP in, intellectual property on our entire like planet has movies and television shows and podcasts. So you can get information on who creates your TV shows and the actors and every, every single person who touches those TV shows. You can get that same information now on podcasts. And what that does for us as podcasters is, it, it, first off, it's a data point Google doesn't know. So now Google's going to know because we have our name and our podcast together linked on IMDb, which is owned by Amazon. Also, um, the power of credits. Not only do am I giving credit to myself, but I'm giving them to all the people who work with me. I couldn't be happier about that part. Uh, all the guests that I have on my podcast now, I can, I can, that's a data point that I connect with IMDb so that if you happen to have guests that do other things in this creative world and people go to their IMDb page, they'll see that they've been on your podcast. So now your guests are a continued part of your discoverability. Um, uh, it's, it, and it's free. That's the best part, by the way. You don't even need, you don't need IMDb Pro to gain access to get and give credit on IMDb and in this creator economy credit, credit is worth a lot. I mean, how many times have you watched the credits at the end of a movie or, you know, I was going to say for me, it was always Vin de Bona on, on a funny America's funniest home, um, funniest home videos. Oh, yeah. uh, right. Like I always remember seeing Vin de Bona cause like my name is Vin. So I thought there could be a place for me in, <laughs> in media. Um, yeah. And those credits matter, you know, in this creator economy, that's, those are the flags. That's how we identify each other. And in this creator economy, unlike in most economies, uh, creators aren't necessarily always hired because they're the best. They're often hired because of the loudest. They're the most, they're mo most authentic, which doesn't even mean best from a performance perspective. Um, they're the most consistent, you know, depending on, on, you know, what you think about the Kardashians or not. They stuck to it. And if they didn't stick to it, they wouldn't be the talent brands they are now. But if we didn't do what we did to them, they wouldn't be the talent brands they are either. So I'm still again, watching their, their new show on Hulu right now. I the power, the power that they have as, you know, uh, uh, storytellers in, in, in real, and how they bounce the story back and forth from each other. That's really the lesson learned with the Kardashians. It's not, it's not that any one of them is, the brilliant mastermind, albeit probably Chris Jenner, <laughs> but that they all respectively know how to, they play It's a like group ping pong, <laughs> group volleyball at that family. Uh, and it's hot potato. And the more it gets passed, the more we see it, the, you know, you know, ever see, you ever been to a bar where someone, they're trying to get that one last Jenga out and the whole room seems to be watching, you know, in anticipation because they've been playing this game for so long. It's literally what, what's to be said about building your credibility on camera, on television, the way the Kardashians did. I don't think you need that level of visibility to be discovered anymore, though, if your shares are there. If, if, you are, if your visibility is mediocre, but your shares are through the roof, if you're creating the likeness of you on Tenor or on Jiffy, where you're able to allow other people to create in your likeness or with your means... If you're if you're if you're finding ways to stand out continuously, then and 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 be part of an ongoing conversation without needing to be present, right? Whether that's you are creating the right merch or you're creating social media at an extent that's shareable, where people are finding the high levels of value in that. That's where you you don't need tremendous visibility to get discovered. And what if you're starting a new business and it's like a tech company or something and you don't want to create your own podcast? How would you, 
How would you help someone like that become yes. more discovered? Yes. So does that person also not want to be a podcast guest also? Or would they maybe be open to being a podcast guest? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. They'd All be right. Because this is my favorite hack right now with podcast guesting is what if I were to ask you, Scott, at the end of this podcast, after you've aired this in front of your audience, and I will do, dude, I will do whatever I can to get my Instagram and social audience. I actually will be able to make more impact on Google because of the algorithm, because of the aggregators and, and the way that I'm exporting out content. But, but if I were to tell you that by, by supporting it, and that by being part of a podcaster, I'm able to show up, get my information out there and not have to be part of the production. Like there's no better way for me to get content out there. If I were to ask you if I can have this file afterwards and then air your podcast on my podcast channel, what I think is, A, my audience is more likely to give you a shot at interviewing me and hearing you interview me if I, if I bring you into my space. So as, in terms of me helping you get discovered, I feel like if I bring you into my world, that my audience doesn't need to go to your world to get exposed to you. If they hear you, then they would take the leap to go over there. Yeah, and and, and in forms of discoverability, twofold that works for me. One, I'm able to get as the value proposition I, I originally set out to do is get more eyeballs on your episode, albeit now distributed on my pad, podcast. But I'm not doing anything to change that outcome. I also don't run ads, so I don't monetize other people's you know content as well. I don't do it that way. Um, and then the, the the uptick for me is that now now I have original content. Now I have a podcast predicated on, on other people's content interviewing me. So hmm. I become the star guest in my own podcast guest series, where instead of me needing to change the topic from episode to episode to make sure my message gets out there. The point of view of the questions that are coming in are changing. So the facts don't change, the stories change, the stories change, but the facts don't change and the characters don't change because of our conversation. Now, if someone meets me for the first time, they want to they go to my website and they're wondering, is this the person for me? Should, what, are, what, is, what are they like as a coach? What are they like as a strategist? Now you've got uh, 20 or so different types of people interviewing me and maybe you could sit in their seat. Maybe you can see yourself sitting in their seat to make that decision. So that's cool. I think that's a big opportunity that, um, that a lot of people aren't, aren't tapping out on only because I think they're afraid to ask for the file for financial reasons. And again, the power in people, I'm not trying to make money on your podcast episode. And I appreciate it being part of my content strategy, but literally my strategy is to inspire content. And there's, uh, you'll see in any of my platforms. I'm not, I don't sell a single thing on any outward post anywhere. I'm just starting to figure out how to work in a group capacity with people because I've been working for years trying to trust the process. Cause I, I, I thought that what I, I thought I have to work really one on, I'm really, really good one-on-one -on -one with people, but I love the group experience. It's just what, what makes impact in a group experience has been, um, uh, hard for me to learn because I, I truly feel like I'm doing something that's that's quite unique where most people when they build brands focus on and it's important to focus on font type and 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 energy and the, the public facing part of it um, at the core of what I do I'm like if we're moving light speed then no one's gonna have time to see any of that shit yeah. <laughs> don't have time to, you know I, I use aggregators I use blog aggregators right now to grow podcasts because I don't I don't want people to see all the artwork and all that stuff that we put on top that might distract you from the five actionable pieces of information people want. So if I can get your podcast episode as a blog and an aggregator called Q, for example, if I can get that in Q where people come every single day to read podcasts, uh, articles, blog articles about certain types of things. So I say, I want, you know, a blog article about podcast marketing. Q gives me 10, 10 blogs that I could be reading that I can also share instantly. So helping people get in that aggregation system, uh, by the way, vpe.tv slash Q U U U three U's, but this is a, this is like my secret trick. It's my number one secret trick in podcast growth right now. Most people are trying to grow social media are, are using social media to grow, uh, podcasting. And what I'm doing in SEO is with, with SEO and, and my understanding of SERP has blown my growth out of the water. Um, and again, I, I only have celebrities on my, 
on my show because of the construct of, of who I talk to and what my podcast is about. So I have to say, it's not about having top performing globally recognized names on your podcast. That's not what's driving growth. It's the people who discover those podcast episodes that are driving growth. So if I can put it in a place where it's instantly shared or easy to be shared or more shareable, then my discovery factor exponentially goes higher where my visibility doesn't need to. And what I like about that is that my neighbors don't need to know what I'm up to. My competition doesn't need to know the secret sauce to how I'm growing my brand. And I have a lot of control over the pivots that I can take as I'm growing as a solopreneur. It's important for me to be able to stop on a dime if I feel like, you know, I need to double down on something and, uh, and that gives me the space to do it. And so what, what would be the number one piece of advice that you would give yourself if you go, go back to yourself five years earlier? Yeah. Clarity. It sucks. Clarity. Genie in a bottle. Be careful what you wish for. I thought I was so clear. I thought I had a niche down also. And I realized, um, and I don't, I, I'm still, I don't like niching down. <laughs> Uh, I'm down to, I'm cool to niche a product. I'm cool to niche a service. You know, I, I know how to make people discoverable. So I can niche that discoverability service or product down for lawyers, accountants, um, business owners, uh, uh, college students. Like I can, I can empathetically put myself in their seat, use their words to adapt what I'm trying to do. But it, you have to have clarity for that. And I, I think I thought I had a level of clarity. You know, if you don't realize that this world is growing exponentially every single day, when you're trying to seek clarity, when you're, when you're trying to find the ultimate definition of who you are, and then, and then five new platforms emerge, two new services go away, Instagram changes the terms of service, you know, the reality, facts change. And that, well, facts don't change, truths change, but, but the fact, facts stay consistent. And all that to be all that to be said with clarity. Uh, when when I finally, and, and you'll hear it even in this interview, where there have been times where, you know, I'm on the tips of my toes, and I can tell you that my the palm of my hands aren't touching the desk, and and I bring that up because when when my palms are touching the desk, when my when my feet and my toes are both firmly grounded, I can be as fantastical and creative as I want, but I can still implement. I don't get lost in the idea. I don't get. I don't succumb to the power of what I don't have control over. And I, I said, I lean into time. I say, I need, I need five minutes to get this first paragraph out to the world so that I can get the next paragraph out to the world. And, and I give myself that space to do it. That's good. I love it. And thank you so much. And, and where can people, where can people discover you or find you if they want to learn more? Oh, I appreciate that. I'm on LinkedIn. So if I got first off, you know, People reach out and it's like, we got a deal on the table. I got to hurry up and make a decision. Like reach out and say, hi, you don't, you don't need, you don't need a guy like me only when you need a guy like me. So say, hi, let me in your world. Let me understand the given circumstances so that when it's time to make decisions that I'm, I'm well equipped to help you. Uh, that being said, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter as myself, normal, uh, and vpe.tv where I have a creator hub. It's always free. Um, and I offer, like, as I mentioned, awards worthy of winning, uh, creator platforms that pay out a, a literal step-by-step -step guide as to how to get your podcast listed on IMDb and the benefits that are included in that. So I, I appreciate the question. Amazing. Thank you so much. And, and we'll talk to you here soon. Thank you.